Good morning, kids. I have a few more things to do, but I wanted to get here on time. Like I have to put my clip in my hair, but it does look good today. Watch, you'll see. But that doesn't matter. What matters is, is I can't record this moment right now, but I wanted to get on with you to tell you what I'm going to do. Look at what I have here. No flowers behind me, but all these seeds. And I went to carry them out and I have seeds spread all over. Look at them. Remember, we were talking about these on Wednesday. Or no, actually it was last Tuesday. We had a special day last week, right? Or a special week. Look at all of them that fell off and they just will spread so easy because as I was walking, they just were falling off the plant. Okay, I want to go spread those, but the reason why I really want to do that right now really quickly is because I want to get some flowers behind me. So I will be right back.
Oh, I could not find my just to record. It wouldn't, wouldn't record to it. So we've got a few things to do. But I wanted to show you what I do as I'm getting my hair put up. I'll do that in a minute. What I do with the flowers here. So I cut them and I usually try and take a little bit more care and making sure that I cut them in ways that are, um, and this poor little one is done with right here. Right here, that poor little one is done with. But I try and get cut them so that I get all of these pretty even is what I like. So they're pretty even right now. Yep, they're pretty even. So I'll just cut them all at about the same spot here. Cut that one off, unfortunately. And uh, that's it. That's it. Then I go, oh, obviously, I'm going to go put them in a vase. So that's what I'm going to go do and get them a little bit more orderly so that I have flowers behind me. Woo! I'll be right back. Here, I'll put a tree in my hair. Here we go. No, stop it. Get to work. It's still in my hair. And I've been using the smaller vase for my flower. So you can see that they're pretty uneven and they're kind of sparse. So I need to, I, I would, you know, go back out there and cut a few more and get this looking a little bit prettier than what it looks right now, right? To get it a little bit more even and stuff. And look at, I keep having these. This is horrible. Who did this? I've had people all over this lawn. We're going to be out tomorrow doing some observations of when we know that people are coming in and disturbing my property. So see this, people just don't want to me to have pretty flowers behind them or to talk to kids the way that I do. They don't want me to do it. They want my job, they want to do it themselves. They think that they could do it better or differently or whatever. They certainly can do it differently. Today, though, what we're going to do right after I fix my hair is we are going to, I kind of move me down. Have a story today. Remember that our early bird classroom really does focus and target on, I sent you an email, dude, answer it. Uh, we really target this classroom for younger kids, right? Younger kids. And so we read stories. And we were here on Wednesday. The last time we were here, well, actually it was on Monday. Last Monday, it was a while ago because Mondays now are, are, are our story days. Are our story days. Mondays are, Tuesdays are. Day one of the week is our story day, Tuesday. Wednesday, we are now, now doing math and science. And Thursday, we are doing phonics. All right? So early birds, you guys have got a great and very diverse, that means a lot of variety is what that means, a very diverse schedule. That's what diverse means. It just means a lot of variety. So you have a lot of variety in your schedule. We're going to get started reading in just a minute right after I put up my hair. Hold on. I'll be right back.
And while I was at it, I also got myself a lemon water. Don't forget that you need to get something in your stomach right away. Right away in the morning, you want to get something in your stomach. You know what that does? It gets your body moving, your stomach moving, all kinds of things. In particular, your stomach moving. And that's like, all right, start feeding me. Did you get some breakfast? Did you brush your teeth this morning? Did you wash your face? Remember, the reason why we stay healthy, they say, oh, take all the shots we give you. No, the reason why we stay healthy is because we stay clean. And we do have some medicines that are really important that have been around for a long time, like penicillin. A really good, yeah, where was that penicillin during COVID? I think that was my butt. <laughs> so don't forget, keep yourself clean. And that's a great way to keep yourself healthy as well. Okay, let's get started with our story today. So reading day. Remember, one of the reasons why we do all of this reading is because... Make sure I'm recording. Yep. One of the reasons why we do all this reading in part is because when we hear, well, the stories are really good, right? And they really do teach us a lot. And I tell you, in all of my classes, I talk about this class in particular because we have so many things that we talk about. We go outside and we talk about science and observation and we talk about the stories that we read and these stories I talk about in our bookless classroom and I talk about them in our critical thinking classroom. And if you can believe it, I talk about the early bird classroom in every single one of my classrooms. It is a, I just love this classroom because it's a great start to my day. I need to open up some windows because it's a, a little stuffy. It was cool in here last night, so I closed all the windows, but it's a little stuffy right now. Let me go open up some windows. So this one here I opened up. Let me go open one up on the side of the house here. So we get some airflow all the way through. One of the things that they did in the 1980s or 70s is, is they built office buildings that didn't have windows that open so that people wouldn't jump out the window or fall out the window, right? Well, you know, those people, if they didn't want to, if they would wanted to jump out that a window, they could find a different window, right? But that was silly. I remember thinking that was the most silly thing. Why? Oh, who would want to be in an office building where you couldn't get a breeze? But they said it was more economical. Of course, why'd they do it? Money. That's what that means. They did it for money is what they did. I know. Surprise. Okay, let's get started. So, other than, of course, I don't have my what? What don't I have? I know, my glasses, but you had to be proud of me. I was on time this morning. I started our class on time. Yeah, well, we got to get going though. We haven't even started reading yet. So, but we did get some flowers here, didn't we? They look a little bit sad, but not too sad. We'll get a few more in here and they'll, they'll look happy, won't they? Okay, folks, so... The last time we were here in our reading class, our early bird reading class, if you remember, we read about Henry's Freedom Box, right? And that was a pretty short story, and it was pretty, it was kind of interesting, but it was a little bit too short, wasn't it? He sent himself, right, to be free is what he did, which is kind of interesting, and it sort of matched a little bit um, our story that we read about Homer, P, the mostly true adventures of Homer P. Fig. We read that in our reading room, and if you didn't catch it, that was a really, really great story. It was the reason why I wanted to read Henry's story, but I didn't think that that story was as interesting as the as the Homer P. Fig one. So our reading room, Homer P. Fig. Now we're reading about Booker T. Washington. Okay, so just give me a minute right now, and let me go get my glasses, okay? I'll be right back.
Can you see all the seeds over here? Look at look at all the seeds that are even in the corner right here of this. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness gracious. Look at that. Somebody's got to do a little bit better job sweeping. So yeah, tens of thousands of seeds all over the place. Let's get on my keyboard too. Looks a mess. They are on my keyboard too. Let's get started. So we've been doing in the bookless classroom, you might know that we've been uh, doing, uh, we've been learning about the Civil War. At first we learned about the American Revolution, right? Which is where we got our independence from England. And then we learned about the Civil War. In the process, we also learned a lot about slavery. We also learned a lot about the, the natives that lived here, right? So the American Indians that lived here. Um, and, and basically those American Indians that still live here have no, no rights as an American citizen. So immigrants that come and work here, they have more rights, far more rights than the American Indians who owned this land. Very interesting the way that money just runs this country. And maybe we need a few more people who have a few more morals. And maybe they might be of a different color and of a different gender would be my guess. So, introduction. Native Americans were the first people to live in what we now call the United States. If you didn't know that. Let me, I'll move up a little bit. Then you can see the picture better. By, 19, by 1776, when the United States became a nation, there were about 250 different Native American tribes scattered across the land. And um, we've had a, we have a map of that as well. And I'm going to actually pull that up for you just because I think it's a really great idea for me to do. And I, and I rearranged all of the um, our files yesterday so I think I should be able to find it pretty quickly. Under map, there we go, and I've got it. So 250, over 250 Native American tribes, and there we can see a map, and that's really quite large right there, but in all of those areas, I'm going to, all of those have the names of different American Indian tribes. So some of them have got um, names that are in larger print. Like Illinois, the state Illinois, the state of Illinois, the state of Michigan is named after Indian tribes. Our whole country is named after Indian tribes all over this country. We have Indian tribe names. I have, a, I have another one too. Let me just, let me look because I think the other one. No, that's that's the best one. I do have another one, but it's um it's a little bit harder to read than that one. So take a peek at that and you can kind of see all of the, um, American Indian tribes, over 250 when we first came to settle this land and got our, um, and got our independence. Each tribe had its own customs and way of life. The type of food the people ate and the kind of houses they built depended on the climate and the wildlife of the area where they lived. So out in the West where it was much drier, they did hunting. They had cattle out in the West. Out in the East where it was much wetter, I think that's the right word, or more wet. No, it would be wetter, I think. Um, it's called a superlative. Super, you're making it super, right? Um, so... Uh, out in the east where it is wetter, more wet, making it super wet, right? Superlative. That's a superlative. 
So making it more wet, or or it is more wet, so they had different crops there, right? In the south, they had tobacco. In the north, they had more industry, right? So depending on the area, right? Depending on the area is where, uh, depended on what you grew, right? What How you could make your money. Each tribe had its own language, its own style of clothes, its own religion, its own games. So, you know, kind of in a way, a little bit like different states that we have here, right? It's not necessarily an own, own, their own religion, but they do. we do have certain religions more in some areas than in other areas. Like Baptists used to be more south, for example. This book tells about how the Cherokee people lived long ago from the year 1740, 36 years before the United States became a, a nation, until 1838. During those years, the Cherokee hunted, farmed, made war, and traded throughout the Great Smoky Mountains in the, Americans, in the Americas Southeast. At the end of the book, you will read about the Cherokee today. The green section on the map of the United States shows where the Cherokee lived. So there, it shows right there where the Cherokee lived. And we can also see that on our map. So that would be probably right. We can look at it, but we'll see how close we are. It's got to be because that's, um, that's where the Great Smoky Mountains are. So let's see what that purple says there. I'll get that blown up a little bit more, a lot more. Is that what that says? It's hard for me to see that, but there are all kinds of nations there. That That is probably where it is. Yep, there it is. I can see it now. So the purple area there says Cherokee. You probably could see it on your big screen, but I couldn't see it. So the purple area right there in the center, right above the red area that says Southeast and has a whole bunch of different names. Uh, of different Indians. I'm going to go up to our area in Michigan here. Lake Erie, you, Lake Erie, you can see, was named after the Erie tribe. Illinois was named after the Illinois tribe. We've got... Uh, Potawatomi, is that what that is? Potawatomi. We have got all kinds of cities here in Michigan that were named like, for example, Pontiac and Cadillac, Michigan. All of those are names of cities. Can we not just grab the one thing for Pete's sake? All of those are cities that we have in our country I don't know why it switches over when that's what I'm grabbing. And then it switches to something else. I picked you. So an interesting thing that you might want to do this summer for a summer uh, boredom buster activity is to find out how many cities in your state are named after American Indian tribes. Native American Indian tribes. That would be kind of interesting to find out. Muskegon is another one here in Michigan. Um, Algonac is another one. Um, I, I could probably, I, right now I'm not thinking of very many of the cities. Leelanau is another one. I would bet almost every single city that we have in here, not Detroit, that's a French name, Detroit, 
right? But I don't know if that was a tribe of Indians or not. So we basically have a whole country named after the Amer in, in memory of the American Indian tribes. I wonder if we made some deal that we would give them, the, give them back their land. You know, they were like, oh, 2025, sure, you could have it back. What happened? I I don't know. All I'm saying is, is what a tribute. We named so many cities after the American Indians. And I don't know why we would have done that when we didn't have any respect for them or didn't show a lot of respect for them, right? Let's continue on. Who are the Cherokee? The Cherokee call themselves, uh-oh, Waya, Yunwaya, Annie Yunwaya. Oh my gosh, I think I did it. Anna Yunwaya. There's the word right there. How I pronounce that early birds, if you remember, is I always take the last syllable. So I did Waya, actually the last two syllables there, right? So I did Waya there, okay, the last two syllables. Then I, then I took Yunwaya. Yunwaya, I added the next syllable, and then I added Ani, Ani Yunwaya. That's how I got that word. That's how I pronounced that word, meaning the principal people. Long ago, they came from the northeast home of the Iroquois-speaking tribes, the Huron. So we have Huron, Lake Huron, right? We have uh, Huron Valley Schools. So Huron, all, so we've got... Uh, um, all kinds of areas here named Huron after that Indian tribe, including rivers, our lake, one of our great lakes after the Huron tribe. Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida. Oneida is the name of um, dishware, Oneida. Onondaga. Onondaga and Mohawk nations and the um, Chicago uh, hockey team is named the Mohawks. Right? There's Muskegon Mohawks as well. I'm not sure if I have that right. I could see the Mohawk logo there. What, what is that hockey team called? We had the Red Wings and the Chicago. Oh my gosh, my whole family is just, just screaming at me. But they've been screaming at me all kinds of things for a while there from Chicago. When the Cherokee migrated south to the Great Smoky Mountains, they kept the language of their ancestors for over for. Over a thousand years, the Cherokees enjoyed their mountain homeland. They believed it was the center of the world. They pictured it as an island hanging by four cords from the sky. Then men from across the ocean came to the Cherokee land and said, Hey, by the way, it's not an island and it's not hanging from the sky. An explorer from Spain named Hernando de Soto. We, we talked about Hernando de Soto in our uh, bookless classroom. I just moved around all of our files, so I just remembered some of the stuff we were learning. Hernando de Soto was the first person from Europe to meet the Cherokee. That was in the year 1540. De Soto and his men were looking for gold in the mountains. Later, people from England and France came to settle in the area. Cherokee life changed the Native Americans. Cha Cherokee life changed as the Native Americans began to trade with the new settlers. And again, so again, most of this is not based on relationships. It's based on money. What do you have? I like that. What do you have? Oh, I like that. All right. Well, I'll give you some of this if you give me some of that. Trade. The illustrations are just great, Kevin. I love them. What was it like to be a Cherokee 200 years ago? What would your home be like? 
would you get to play? What clothes would you wear? This book will tell you what it would be like if you lived with the Cherokee. Look at the timeline. The part in color shows the years this book is about. So remember, Cherokee did live before. Obviously, they were here thousands of years, they said, right? Thousands of years. But this, but we don't know about those years, right? We don't know about those years, so we can't write about them in the books. So this is what we know about. So those are the years that this book is going to write about. Let's look at the timeline. It says in 1620, Pilgrims Land at Plymouth Rock, which is now the Boston area, basically, from what I understand. And then there's 1740 is when they're starting their timeline. And 1776, American Revolution and the 13 colonies became the United States. We also have a picture of those 13 colonies as well. I think I'll put those in there as well for you. So here is a map of our 13 original colonies there. And in this map, it's hard to tell, but you can see that the original states were actually, some of them were bigger than what they are today. But there's the original 13 colonies right there on the map. I'll, I'm going to take that down. You can pause it if you need to see that again. I'll probably refer back to it again. And 1787, the United States Constitution is written. In 1809, Abraham Lincoln is born. In 1812, the War of 1812 occurs. We talked about the War of 1812 in our bookless classroom. That was really a big deal for the United States. It was. 1829, Andrew Jackson is elected the seventh president. Martin Van Buren in 1837 was elected the eighth president. Those are important presidents because that that was they were important presidents in what ended up becoming the future for the Cherokee Nation. What would you look like? If you were Cherokee, the color of your skin might be light tan or dark tan. Your hair would be black and straight. You would be slim because of the games you played and the work you did. If you, were a girl, if you were a girl, you rarely cut your hair. For the Cherokee, long hair was beautiful hair. When your hair was long enough, you tied it up. Boys and men shaved or plucked their hair so that only a small patch was left on top. So women had beautiful, long black hair. The men shaved it on top. What did you wear? Before the new settlers came, your clothes were made from animal skins. In summer, children under the age of eight didn't have to worry about clothes. They wore nothing in the warm months. Men and older boys w wore deerskin shirts and breech clouts. A breech clout was a band of deer skin that hung from the belt at the waist. Women and older girls wore deer skin skirts wrapped around their waists. So this, this here must be the breech clout right there. So they've got that around their waist and then those, those hang down there and cover up their private parts is what they do, right? But they obviously didn't have that big of a deal about their private parts because they were running around naked until they were eight, right? They didn't, so they didn't worry so much about their private parts as much as we did. They even said women and older girls wore deerskin skirts wrapped around their waist. They didn't say anything about their tops though, did they? They didn't. In winter, men and boys wore animal skins, such as bear, panther, and beaver, with the fur on the inside for warmth. They wore moccasins on their feet and long deerskin leggings. Women and girls wore skirts made of buffalo calfskin with their hair on the, so on the inside. So, so the warm hair from the animal would be on the inside of their clothes. 
They wore deerskin shirts decorated with small turkey feathers. Oh, look at that. That's what those are. Those are turkey feathers then. So they really tried to make, and so the women wanted to look nicer, right? The men, they don't care, whatever. But the women, hey, I would like to look pretty. I find that kind of interesting as well. Women and girls wore jewelry around their necks, wrists, and ankles. You made your own jewelry from shells, seeds, bone, animal teeth, stones, and feathers. Men like to wear armbands of leather or copper and hair decorations such as feathers. Cherokee people also used their shell beads, stone discs, porcupine quills, feathers, and animal hair to decorate their clothes. Cherokee clothes changed when the Cherokee began trading with new white settlers. Shirts and skirts were made from cloth instead of animal skins. Glass beads from Spain and France were used to decorate clothing. So it made it very pretty, right? And it also made their clothing a little different when they had those beads imported or other decorations for their clothes imported. Who was in your family? You would live with your mother and father and brothers and sisters and your mother's parents, but you would belong to an even larger family called a clan. There were seven clans, bird, wolf, deer, wild potato, what? Long hair, blue, and paint. Members of each clan lived in every village. That's very interesting, isn't it? So every village of Indians had seven clans. Bird, so that's probably as you were growing up, right? Just like you are the early birds, right? You're the early birds, and that's the youngest group I have. So birds, wolf, deer, wild potato, what? Long hair, blue, and paint. Your mother and father belonged to different clans. You would be part of your mother's clan, not your father's. If your mother was a bird and your father a paint, you would be a bird. Your relatives were your mother's family, her mother, grandmother, aunts, sisters, brothers, and cousins. Interesting. How did people get married? So that's interesting that your family was considered your mother's family. So, so the father basically had no family. It's just, that's a little weird, isn't it? I don't know. I'm not understanding it completely. How did people get married? To get married, your two families exchanged special gifts. The groom would send deer meat to the girl's family. This proved he was a good hunter and would always provide his wife with food. The bride gave him an ear of corn to show she would tend to her gardening and she could prepare good food. So, so deer meat to the girl's family. So that was probably pretty useful. And the girl gave him an ear of corn showing that I'll garden for you and prepare your food. That's nice. After the wedding ceremony, the man moved into the woman's house with her family because he had no family. To get divorced, a Cherokee woman had only to put her husband's things outside the door of their house. That meant he had to move away. It was forbidden to marry someone from your own clan. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay. How did you get your name? You might have several different names during your life. First, your parents named you. Four to seven days after your birth, your family held a special ceremony. That was, where, that was when you got your name. You might be named for something special, such as your eyes or your smile. When you were older, you could add a name or change your name. You might pick your new name to show something important you could do. Or you might choose a name to show how you did something difficult or dangerous or to describe something about you. Would you pick a different name? If you had a chance to pick a different name, add to your name, would you change your name? Would you add to your name? And what would you add? What would you add to your name? Or would you change your name? I like my name, Annette. I didn't always like it. I think when you're young, lots of people don't like their names. But I, like, but I, I was okay with it. Now I really like my name because I know what it means. It means little grace. And I like that a lot. So I wouldn't change my name. 
I like it. When you were older, oh, we already said that. If you were a good swimmer, you might wish to be named Ayunini, which means swimmer. If you were a happy person, you might wish to be called Ayoka, she who brings happiness. If you were beautiful, you might want to be named Kabama, butterfly. A good hunter might choose the name Kanadi, lucky hunter. As you grew older, you could change your name again. What would your house look like? You would live in two different houses with your large family. One house would be your home in the hot summer months. Your winter home would be nearby. Wow, how about that? Two homes, that's kind of cool. Oh, here's my summer home over here, and I will be over here during the cool months. Your summer home might be made entirely of logs, or it might be made of small trees and stalks of switchgrass, tall bamboo-like cane grass that grew near the river. Posts cut from trees made the frame of the house, and stalks of dry cane were woven between the posts to make the walls. The cane was then covered with a thin layer of mud. So these are mud homes, mud houses. The door of your summer house was a deer skin that could be pulled back to let in sunlight and cool breezes. There was a roof made of tree bark shingles with a hole in it to let out smoke from the fireplace that was in the center of the house. So the materials were different, but it looks very similar, doesn't it, to what we have for homes right now. Your bed would be at one end along your family's beds. The bed frames were made of woven cane stalks held up by wooden posts. Pine bows or molding like a mattress. Beaver, otter, or buffalo skin blankets kept you warm. Your, father, your father's weapons would hang from a wall within easy reach should enemies attack. There would be plenty of room in your summer house for you to weave baskets, repair weapons, or make new deerskin clothes. Okay, that's where we are going to end. We are going to pick this up on page 20. Don't tell me that you have not gotten that email. We'll pick this up back on page 20 on Tuesday because tomorrow we are so so it's going to take us a while to remember what we read about in our stories so we're going to have a few questions when we're all done we might even have some questions about Henry's freedom box as well uh, that helps us remember what we're reading right so we're all set for today for our early bird classroom this is Dr. Annette Farovich I gotta fix my flowers a little bit but new flowers waiting for these little seeds to kind of get to mess up. Look at, look at all those seeds all the way down. I cannot even believe it. I got to clean that mess up too. Dr. Annette Farovich, I'm the teacher and you are here in the classroom, the early bird classroom. Thanks for joining me live. If you did, I am here. Don't forget to check out my uh, website, www.healthymindbodyspirit.net. Thanks for joining me.